Uh, next up, uh, we have Paul Shapiro to speak about the challenges of building code on, uh, excuse me, building software with Monero code. Thank you very much. Hey, what's up, everyone? I think I'm going to move this down already. Considerably different height. All right. Um, so my name is Paul Shapiro. I'm the CEO at My Monero, which is a wallet software company. We also do some contribution to Monero itself, uh, primarily in the form of uh, initial factoring and code quality improvements. And we've also contributed a light wallet server to the Monero code base. And I'll get into that a little bit more. I guess that's the clicker. So. Everyone's having trouble with this clicker. There we go. Might be the table? I think so. It's a Faraday table. So uh, just to introduce Monero a little bit, uh, Monero is a free and open source project. There's no corporation or single lead architect behind it. And its code base, as a few other people have touched upon, is from unknown authors, began without comments, or the comments were sort of intentionally ripped out or something like that. And it borrowed multiple components from somewhat unknown sources. One of them is uh, a library which is known as EPE, um, which is sort of like a utility class. And it also has these custom wire formats, which are pretty strange. Development progress is decentralized across hundreds of contributors around the world. So it's a massive open source project. And as a result, it's really hard to put the project itself on pause and say, OK, guys, like, let's stop writing code. Let's kind of resimplify things, refigure out what the overall architecture has to be or the overall project requirements are. Because that's just a natural part of writing software. You have to occasionally kind of review everything and say, OK, let's like re-engineer things uh, with a, a known problem description instead of just this sort of like amorphous fluid description that's evolved over time. So the complexity of the existing code makes extending it and integrating with it very difficult. So there's tons of ground for me to cover in a short period of time. I thought it was actually 15 minutes. Turns out it's a little bit longer. I'm going to zoom through anyway. I managed to stick an emoji in my talk. So, uh, so, so we have a legacy of code. So basically, there's EPE, which is this kind of like kitchen sink uh, utility class, or, uh, not utility class, utility library with just like tons and tons and tons of things inside of it, which is, as a, as a kitchen sink, it's a sort of notoriously bad thing to do in your code bases, and I'll get into why later. The core crypto itself is actually relatively well factored. Um, not everything is impeccably named, and that leads to some inefficiencies in uh, improving or optimizing the code base, because it's a question of readability of the actual results that you're obtaining as you perform all these different calculations as you go along. Uh, there's also something called Simple Wallet. Everyone knows about the CLI application. That's Simple Wallet in the code. They call it Simple Wallet. And then the backing, the business logic backing of that is called Wallet2. So Simple Wallet's great. Wallet2 is very complicated. The code that the Monero project inherited uh, originally had multiple sources of contribution to begin with. So it's like multiple, multiple authors to begin with. So this talk is going to be about the fact that the original MyMonero.com, the, the company that I work on, the, it's a web wallet, uh, had core architecture, which was originally the core Monero cryptography transpiled into ASM.js, which is just sort of like an ASM lookalike that can run in the browser as native JS. And then there was a whole bunch of handwritten vendor JavaScript stuck on top of that. And the reason that we did that was because as a light wallet, the spend key is never sent to the server. It's always kept in the browser. So you know, transactions are constructed in the browser. Uh, key images are calculated in the browser to determine how much of the balance has already been spent. And Monero has these periodic six-month six month mandatory security upgrades, AKA hard forks. And so the sustainability of re-implementing all of this transaction construction and like key image generation and key generation and key derivation stuff was untenable. Uh, it became untenable over time, at least for like sort of a, a one or two person shop. So we needed a new solution. And the idea was like, OK, let's try to transpile all of the C++ code that's necessary to to kind of implement you know, all the transaction construction and stuff like that. But there was a wall that was hit, which was that the Monero code is largely much too tangled and complicated, has way too many dependencies. So this talk is one in which Endogenic, which is my online handle that I'm stuck with, apparently, 
uh, complains about Monero's code quality, but don't get me wrong, I actually have tons of respect for the major code contributors like Monero Moo and people like that. Um, and I'd like to give a major shout out to them because they are the collective bomb. So Epe, contrib slash Epe is an inherited library. It contains code for, I'm glad I took notes on this here, it contains code for wipeable memory, regular expressions, logging, compiler warnings, hashing algorithms, MISC language utils, whatever that means, tons of TCP and HTTP server code, client code, authentication code, and all this stuff, like the TCP and HTTP stuff, we shouldn't even have written that, or like there, it shouldn't be vendored. It should basically be, generally speaking, it should be stuff that we're using an existing well-maintained library to, to, to implement. A bunch of math helper code, profiling, like time profiling performance, hex coding, command line stuff, JSON parsing. So what is Epe's scope exactly? Like if we look at this, the set of functionality described by those modules there, like what is Epe's actual scope? You know, why doesn't this stuff go somewhere else and why doesn't more stuff go into Epe? So ambiguous domain scopes lead to code duplication, like EPE and this uh, other directory, source slash serialization, uh, both contain separate parsing code. Each was written for formats that we've never seen before. And they're also different. One is for the peer-to-peer -peer protocol and the other is for transactions and blocks. Did I get that right? So there's this other directory in there called source common. It contains code for DNS, software update, file system, performance signing, more performance signing. Uh, a thousand line, fo uh, thousand line file called util, which I guess was just named that for the lulls, because why not? Thread pools, JSON, more JSON, password management, HTTP connection code again, which incidentally actually depends on that aforementioned uh, EPE HTTP code. Internationalization, down anyway, so what constitutes common code again, when for example the core Monero crypto code can be considered just as commonly usable by other modules as anything that could be called common? So, and the, uh, this is the big deal. Anyone who wants to use code which is entangled with common must import, for example, DNS resolution code like libunbound, which is a dependency that you don't necessarily want to have to import if you're just trying to do some cryptography. So a future path for EPE and common. So EPE and common are too big to fail by modern parlance. And rather than a, attempt to refine them or save them or whatever, whatever we have to just break them apart. And the correct way to do this, the correct way to build code like this is to build top level, like root level modules. And they should be, they should, uh, be applied or um, uh, what, what should be done is that a specific problem domain, a very concrete set of problems should be you know, delineated and used to come up with the name for this code module and that name should be rigorous enough to uh, describe everything that actually lives within there. So relatively good examples of like well-contained modules at the high level or the root level are source slash ring CT and simple wallet. Of course, ring CT has some variable naming issues, but anyway, if we don't do this, code keeps getting added to these ambiguously named domain scopes or these um, you know, uh, namespaces, and it, it ends up growing. The, the actual domain of that scope is invisible and not well specified, so it ends up kind of invisibly or covertly growing and especially with tons and tons of contributors who aren't centrally coordinated in any manner. And now I get to the really fun part. So Wallet2 is a Monero wallet implementation class that's used by virtually every Monero wallet that's out there, except for my Monero. So it, it's, uh, it contains all sorts of stuff that it shouldn't necessarily contain or which there should be at least some sort of separate implementation that doesn't contain that stuff, so like address book and persistence and very specific runtime structures. Um, it's a full wallet, but it also contains logical branches to light wallet code, which were written by um, another contributor, a very eminent contributor, quite a while ago. But I already know that that code is not really in use by anyone, because there's an assertion in that code that has the inverse condition, the logical condition that it should. And so if anyone were running that code, their code would be crashing. So. Basically, no one's really even maintaining it. And there's all this like dead code that's in Wallet too. And in addition, uh, it has some other you know big issues. Like there are a bunch of data structures that are defined in Wallet too that should be much more generalized to Monero itself. And then this is a really big one. Most people don't realize this, but the actual literal serialization format of transactions on the wire is actually very uh, specific to C++ structs. 
So in my Monero back in the day, before, you know, not too long ago, but when all this stuff was implemented in JavaScript, we had to literally mimic the byte for byte format. We had to construct it by hand. And like that doesn't make any sense for like a global protocol. Um, so in, yeah, and this serialization has to occur uh, to compute the hashes to sign for the transaction submission to the network. So, but Wallet2 has all of this reusable code that's just bound up inside of it that is actually specific to Monero and not specific to Wallet2. But in order to use it, you have to take on all of these dependencies and you know, all this complicated code. So there's, there's code that everyone else wants to use, which can't be used right now without implementing all of Wallet2, like calculating transaction fees and weights. Um, if we didn't do this, if everyone used different fees, then adversaries, or not adversaries, but forensic an analysts would be able to look at the blockchain and say, hey, you know, it's pretty obvious that whoever's making all these transactions is using this client, because that's how they calculate fees. So those should all be the same. For the same reason, decoy selection, like actual output selection for constructing rings, or input selection, rather. Uh, output scanning, scanning the blockchain with your view key. Sub address expansion. I'm just going to zoom through these because there are way too many. I actually have three pages of these. Daemon and server integration, like networking and parsing. Multi sig key exchange implementation. Account class integration for key generation and management. Payment ID parsing. Payment ID construction, although you can go through core crypto for that. Uh, per sub address balance calculation, the status of transactions. Uh, parsing the serialized transaction strings, signing transactions, constructing transactions, and <laughs> if you guys ever want to go crazy, like take a look at create transactions too in Wallet 2. It's like literally the longest function I've ever seen. It's huge. Um, so if people construct transactions in different ways, then they can be fingerprinted by the way that they construct transactions. So this is actually sort of like a, a fungibility threat to Monero itself. More examples, spend and reserve proof derivations, URI construction and parsing, fork specific information and behavior toggles, which obviously everyone wants to use, data signing, and a lot of other cool things. And then there's this other weird thing called, well, I shouldn't probably have said it's weird, but someone, some people came along and built this thing called source wallet slash API for the GUI, which is actually uh, something that kind of hangs on to an instance of wallet too, and then provides another API that is supposed to then be stable or something, but it lives within the same repository. So it's like, why isn't the interface for that on Wallet2 itself? That's kind of the point of class interfaces. And it, Wallet slash API contains a whole bunch of other functionality, um, like a wallet manager and an actual interface to the wallet. Um, and all these things should basically already be in Wallet2, or Wallet2 should be at a lower level. So um, a bunch of integrators interact with this Wallet API, but they ought to have been coded to Wallet2. And new integrators don't know that they probably shouldn't actually be using wallet slash API. And then, so like one example of an integration that uh, I think is well justified that would end up needing to use a bunch of this wallet to bound implementation is a light wallet server, uh, which is basically like um, something that sits in front of a node and does the scanning for you so you don't have to always be scanning on your actual device. You can have like a server at home that's scanning for you. So we built and released an open sourceable version of the server. It's currently awaiting uh, final reviews of a pull request. Um, but it, but Wallet2 contains implementation that that light wallet server needs, like obtaining decoy outputs and the selection distribution for actually constructing ring signatures, um, scanning outputs, and then payment ID decryption of the payment IDs that are actually on transactions. So. Um, we also wanted to use a bunch of the wallet two code um, in order to, you know, implement our, our wallet, you know, transpiling all that stuff to, to ASMJS or WebAssembly. And wallet two already contains a bunch of that light wallet implementation, like I mentioned, but we couldn't really use it because of its complexity. So I was thinking like, well, could we eventually converge the my Monero code and the Monero code? So I spent uh, quite a while factoring wallet two. Uh, all the transaction construction stuff, and I ran into this problem. Like, I actually succeeded in doing this a number of times. Like, uh, eventually, it was like I think three times total. But the 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 pace of Monero development itself meant that the work that I had to do to factor it or you know um, reorganize things or whatever had to be redone a couple times in certain cases. And uh, I ended up just not doing the pull request. Um, it effectively became a full time job for me, where. Um, you know, the pace of Monero development meant that I could never actually get to the point where I could do my f actual full-time job at the same time as working on the Monero code. 
Um, and this is actually a pattern I've noticed with people that try to work with the Monero code. Um, so my interim creative solution was actually literally rewriting by hand the JavaScript code that we had implemented on top of that core crypto stuff. I wrote that in C++ and then I transpiled that into JavaScript. And now what we can do is use the C++ uh, on every platform that can run that natively like iOS and then for our web wallet, for example, we can use the same code transpiled. So, um, so I'm actually hooking into the same underlying crypto note utils uh, transaction construct TX code entry point that wallet two's uh, create transaction two is hooking into, but there's so much additional code um, that needs to converge, should converge. So I ended up coming up with this thing called uh, core CPP, which is much more sustainable than the handwritten JavaScript because it shares a lot of code with the Monero C++ core now, but it's not the perfect, perfect solution. Um, there's still a divergence of code and uh, it actually has to embed a stripped down version of the Monero core itself because you know, obviously you can't, um, can't keep all of those dependencies and all of the different things that, there's just like so much additional code that's not, that most integrators would just not need. Um, so currently core CPP powers a bunch of light wallet applications and even some full wallet, full wallet applications who just connect to nodes but they need utility Monero code uh, even for a full wallet. So it just goes to show that like Wallet2 is um, not exactly usable or the most viable option for, um, for even full wallet implementers. Um, and it used to be the case that there were a lot of reports of people just kind of like giving up on integrating Monero into their product or into their service. And nowadays we don't really, we don't really hear too many reports of that anymore. And I think it's partially to do with this. Uh, if you guys want to check it out, Core CPP is transpiled to JavaScript and it's the new Core JS that we have. Uh, so I want to propose some solutions for the situation that we're in. I suggest that we do a simple algebraic factoring of Wallet2. Like sometimes when people say refactor, they actually mean rewrite. We shouldn't do that. So it's, it's a bad idea probably, unless there's like some hero that comes along who's like actually capable of doing it. But simple algebraic factoring, just like tease things apart, create pure functions which don't modify the state of an object, but which take state and return results. And that way anyone can use those at that point. And then I suggest that we factor a wallet base out of wallet two, and then we inject dependencies or hooks for the persistence or the, um, and we also extract the address book and the data structures and stuff like that. We can move wallet API to the GUI repository or actually better, we should extract the useful code from it, add it to wallet two or wallet base, and then have the GUI code and all other applications uh, have like the sort of guideline of using the wallet two object directly if they want to, or they can use wallet base or just inherit from wallet base. Um, I see you're a programmer because you're, you're nodding. You know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, so like Wallet ma Manager, for example, doesn't really belong in the core Monero code. Like Simple Wallet just uses Wallet2 directly. That's like, that's like um, evidence that we don't really need this additional API thing on top. And to go further, we could extract Simple Wallet and other non-Monero generic code from the existing singular repository that we have on GitHub, and then move that into separate library or separate repositories, and then create like a very stripped-down core Monero library. And I guess like in the future, as Ricardo was saying, uh, people are going to move to Rust. We could use this core Monero uh, library uh, and maybe do like FFI binding into it or something like that. Um, I think we should create a, a lib wallet which probably embeds this lib Monero core, and then that should contain the actual wallet base and stuff that other people are gonna wanna use, a bunch of those factored pure functions and things like that. And we should probably split the daemon and the light wallet server and the RPC server from lib Monero core, either into their own repositories, ideally, probably, that's, that's what I would do. Um, or they could probably live in a single repository, like a command line repository. So some food for thought. And um, how am I doing on time? Five minutes. So. Um, code improvements to Monero have significant value for the ecosystem, not just in terms of growth, but in terms of um, like the growth of the ecosystem, but in terms of the pace and the efficiency of the actual progress on uh, our own like official apps and the actual functionality and the actual implementation that we've, that we've made so far. Um, and there's this, uh, there's this quote from a book um, named Hackers and Painters by Paul Graham. Paul Graham's like this Lisp hacker and uh, he founded Y Combinator and it's, um, the, the quote is, cruft breeds cruft. So it's the idea that like software entropy, uh, when an entropy is higher, it's gonna, it's gonna in increase uh, based on the existing amount of entropy. 
So it's harder to change code with more entropy. When you try to change it, it always increases the entropy usually, unless you factor and reduce it. So I think that, I mean, it kind of sounds far-fetched, but personally I think that increasing code entropy, because it's so, um, it looks kind of innocent, or there's like plausible deniability associated with it, I think that because it can stop the pace of progress of Monero, I think it could actually be considered an attack vector on Monero. Because progress will become harder, we're gonna have to stop at a certain point and just completely rewrite stuff. And that can actually kill projects. That, that's killed early browser projects. You know, there are many projects that were just killed by them getting to the point where the existing team was like, look, we can't really do this anymore. We're gonna need to rewrite this. And then they just like, they try. And they don't really have their eye on the ball or they don't go completely to the, the finish line. And they end up just kind of like giving up. So that could happen. This could be an actual threat to Monero. So a big contributing factor to the complex architecture is that uh, development, the, the developers are oftentimes not continuously uh, confirming the problem that they're solving while they're writing code. It's like when we add code to a specific location, are we adding it there because we're lazy and we don't want to like open up the other file and figure out like the most like the proper way to do it, or are we adding it because like that's the right place to put it? So easy is not the same as simple. And there's this uh, other very eminent um, architect, uh, like software architect, Rich Hickey, who says choose easiness along the simplicity path. So always prioritize simplicity, but choose the, the easier, like choose the thing that's gonna be easier along that path. And so um, one thing that VT Nerd mentioned is that many of these issues center on dependency, dependencies, like what dependencies they have. So much of this code wasn't really written to limit its usage of dependencies or um, thinking about how um, like some minor change in the specification is gonna require like a, um, like a massive change to how the code is actually implemented or integrated with. And code should ideally be able to be written once and it should be able to live forever. That's the idea behind it. And so naming things is super important to that. So uh, in the future, there's a push to factor by myself or by me, uh, VT Nerd, another individual, Endorf, who's in the audience as well. Um, I mentioned some of my past efforts, like the creation of Wallet 3, some pure functions, a minimal Monero core. There are upcoming uh, attempts at improving code quality by Woodzer, who's right there, and uh, VT Nerd. And then there's just very deep community support already, like Monero Moo and Hike, or Heisey, I prefer to say Heisey, uh, and Fluffy Pony. Everyone's on board. It's just a question of like, who's gonna actually do this? But I don't think that's quite good enough. I think that because of the fact that this is so critical to our future and because it's so beneficial to us, I think that we need to make it a tradition in Monero itself to celebrate work on simplifying and improving our code quality. So please, everyone feel free to join us for discussion about factorization uh, on IRC in Monero Dev. More and more people are realizing how important this work is. And in summary, there's just lots of value to factoring our code, keeping it low entropy, keeping it simple and accessible. But there are very specific, unique challenges to doing this in a project that's as fast moving and as decentralized and as sort of like free and open as Monero is. And I do think that we'll reach a point where we're gonna have to rewrite a bunch of stuff. That might end up being the case that we'll just kind of go to rust immediately. Um, but uh, it's gonna become a problem. There are really simple ways to solve this and we have to integrate those solutions or those methods of solution into our daily practices as developers um, instead of pushing it to the future. And we must destroy EPE and Source Common, but lovingly. And we must pour a Barolo for them. A little inside joke. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> any questions? I think I might have like one minute for one question. Uh, actually, we have a little bit. Just, yeah. Does anybody have any quick questions for Paul before we get going? We have at least one over here. Wonderful. Uh, I mean, you mentioned IRC, Monero Dev, of course. Um, is there, I mean, given the scope of the project, IRC itself, due to sort of the temporal nature, might not be the best for like potentially planning and tracking over prog progress. Is there like um, like an issue or like you know, I don't know, like an epic or something that we can potentially yeah. watch and chime into? Or so part of the problem with that is that like we could call out specific areas of the code that need attention, but they're going to change relatively quickly. So I think it needs to be kind of like a living effort and uh, we need a more flexible approach. I do think that uh, issue tracking is applicable. I think it's a good idea and it'll be useful. But the people who are involved in that are going to have to be, um, they're going to have to be updating that stuff. And, you know, uh, in some cases it's, it's, it's just the case that 
it's more efficient for whoever notices the issue to just fix it right there. Because honestly, that's usually all it takes. And it's usually just that people are like, no, I'm not going to do that. Like, I have more important stuff to do. But actually, they don't necessarily. I think, that it, I think that we might need to change our priorities a little bit in terms of how we write code. It's like we should always be factoring. <laughs> ABF, always be factoring. So. We actually have more time for questions. Uh, does anybody have anything else? OK, we have two over there, at least. My man, Jethro. Hey, hey. What's up? <laughs> Well, you know how dear this topic is to me as well. That um, I do. So, like, I wonder, kind of as a follow-on to that, that last question, I wonder whether it might be nice to have a dedicated IRC channel, actually, yeah. for, for this. Because so, I think one of the problems with um, new changes that come along board is they get mixed up into conversation, the... the current kind of things that are being worked on as yeah. opposed to that taking a step to the side and and of course Moo will still contribute into that channel as well but it's kind of like a different mindset because what you're talking about here is really about a mindset change yeah. I think as much as it is so yeah let's have a new IRC channel yeah. and uh, work on that yeah so I actually made one Monero dash new libs but um but it's actually because of the fact that this needs to be integrated into our culture in a way. It started to occur to me that maybe it shouldn't be separate, at least not right now. Um, there wasn't enough uh, community awareness at the time, I think, to really make that an effective strategy. But I think that as this, um, I mean, more and more people are starting to become involved in this. So I think it could actually make sense. So I think that's a good idea. Yeah. Cool. So that's Monero dash new libs. OK, yeah. I'll hang out there. Cool. Yeah, welcome. <laughs> Alrighty. Hey. Um, hey. You kind of ended on a on a, a dark note. Dark note. Yeah. There's a bad I'm just problem. A dark it's getting kinda, worse. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so and I mean it's a it's a limited very limited pool of people. Like there's a lot of contributors, but I don't think that there's a very many people who have a, a kind of grasp good, of factoring or or, or, or grasp, just grasp a, of the functionality of the code base of the whole code base. So they kind of have a um, good perspective on where things should belong necessarily. And so, I mean, you mentioned a few people, and I, I was just curious if you thought, and, and, and in your response to questions, you've indicated you think it should be a, a kind of group effort and yes. change of mindset. But I thought, I was just curious if you thought it's worth trying to convince a single person to kind I, of. I've already it. tried. I've been working on that. So for like you don't two think years. that's the way to go, I guess? No, no. I don't, I don't think it's right either. I don't, think, I don't think it's right, and I don't think it's the solution either, because it's not just the case that the responsibility to factor the entire Monero code base cannot fall on the shoulders of one individual. But it's also the case that it's, that's not sustainable and it's not the real solution because pe more people are just going to come and add code on top of their beautiful effort. So I do think it has to be um, uh, sort of like a grassroots thing. Like it has to be ground up. Yep. And um, But I think also that the Monero code base is actually not that crazy in terms of its functional scope and its organization. Um, I think that if you were to, as a, as a sort of disinterested engineer, come into Wallet2 and take a look at it, you'd be able to see right off the bat that there are a whole bunch of functions that literally just can be extracted as pure functions very, very easily. And just, you know, if you know a little bit about Monero, you'd be able to see, as that engineer looking at Wallet2, that those are things that other people are going to want to use. So, does that make sense? Yeah. Time for one last question over here. Um, you quite nicely presented what the functionality of EPE and Common currently contains. Do you have yeah. a proper document specking this out, or is this what you uh, no, wrote was, down, basically? Yeah, that was my analysis, like my little observation of what it does. But I mean, honestly, like I could I could list out all the files for you. I could list out all the functions and all the integrators of those those things. But again, Monero is very fluid; it changes all the time. That's one of the problems with you know writing documents and being like, hey, this is like it, there's sort of uh, it needs to be flexible. It needs to be like a group of people who are actually involved in it. So the problem I encountered so far with wanting to refactor e either functions in EPE or Common is that I simply don't know where else to put them. Right. Well, so um, I I could go th back through some of the examples there, but um, but generally speaking, the idea is what you want to do is um, identify the problem domain that that code is uh, involved in solving and 
then you figure out how to describe that in a very concrete, rigorous manner. And then you just make, like, don't be afraid to make like a top level, like root level module with that name and just put it in there. Like, you know, wallets, for example, is a pretty good module name, but it's, but it's actually on the, the responsibilities on the, the programmer to make sure that whatever they put in there is actually appropriate. Yeah. It's, it takes practice. It took me years to like really perfect, not for perfect, I haven't perfected it, but to like really get like a, a sort of like, um, where, like where I felt like I knew what I was doing. Yeah. All right, well everybody, let's thank Paul again. Thanks. Thanks.